Hi, everyone. I just want to give you a heads up. Today, we're going to be talking about the movie Magnolia. And if you haven't seen it, there are some situations having to do with sexual abuse. So we wanted to give you a heads up before you started listening to the episode. Otherwise, we hope you enjoy the episode. Hey, DJ, someday can we sing Amy Man? We don't sing it to each other. I'll text you. You'll hit play. And then we'll just sing it alone to ourselves yeah. while sort of looking wistfully at the floor. Yeah. If you ever just text me now, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll know that's what you mean. <laughs> going to name kinds of magnolias. Oh, well, there's, of course, the Southern Magnolia and the Japanese Magnolia. And DJ, go ahead with the next few magnolias. Sweet Bay. Oh. <laughs> saucer Magnolia. That's what we've got. A saucer Magnolia. Salsa? I'm sorry, salsa? Saucer. Oh, saucer. no, that makes more sense. Like chaucer. Well, I thought Sweet Bay and then salsa. There's just yeah. things you put on top of other foods. Right. <laughs> I think you did make that joke last time. Did, did I really? <laughs> Uh, going into the deep well of Magnolia-based jokes. Mm, yes. You have Magnolia Magazine, of course, from Joy... What's her name? Chip Gaines and other Gaines? Woman Gaines? Joy Gaines? They seem like perfectly nice people. They're certainly not in a religious church that you should be concerned about. Please, no questions about our church. We go... Joanna. I called her Joy. We're close. Joy. But Joanna, Joanna Gaines. Don't worry, their church is normal. It has normal beliefs in the mainstream of most churches. So no reason to dig in because it's all standard stuff. We had some questions about your our new channel, the Magnolia channel. <laughs> Good. We yeah, the answer answers, is but... shiplap. To whatever question you're asking, <laughs> it's shiplap. And gray wood floors. Mmm, the warming colors of gray. <laughs> Welcome to Your Inner Child is an Idiot, the podcast where we look back on things from our Sometimes childhood. Sometimes I forget we're recording the podcast. <laughs> and see if they're any good. My name is DJ. My name is Damon. Hi. Hi. Damon. Oh, no. Do not. I need you to no. resist the urge oh. to okay. say respect the cock. Repeatedly well. <laughs> in this episode. <laughs> Thank please. you for telling me. Because please. I do usually shout it at any yes. opportunity. Don't you say it enough in regular conversation? I think the problem with our society, if I were to name one thing, mm -hmm. is that people don't respect becocked individuals mm -hmm. enough. Yeah, yeah. We, That's one the of issue. these days, we're going to get our due. In a lot of ways, the people who control, I would estimate, 85% of Congress and 70% <laughs> of the Supreme Court, they and 100% of all presidents are probably the most oppressed minority of our yeah. time. Wouldn't you agree? I absolutely would agree, and you can quote me on that, and there won't be any issues for me <laughs> in that regard. Wondrous. Well, I feel like this is done. Magnolia, thumbs up. Your inner child is not an idiot, I guess. <laughs> this, In case you have no idea what we're talking about, <laughs> there's – so Tom Cruise is in this movie portraying a – And what movie is this? This is Magnolia, 2004. Okay. Yeah. okay. PTA, 2004. Paul Thomas Anderson. 2004? Is it not 2004? Is it that early? It is Paul Thomas Ang Anderson, or Angerson, as I call him. I think it's 2004. I'm going to stick with that. You All tell right. me if I'm right or wrong. You want me to give you the over-under? Oh, that's interesting. What? 1999. Oh, shit. <laughs> it was in my high school days. You know, still, uh, you know, betting prom women. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was thinking of, because we, we recently talked about Napoleon Dynamite. I think that's actually what I was thinking. That's of. A, the literal year of Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> I get, okay, I'm not good with years, okay? Okay, ever since 1892 when I was born, okay? You're good at, uh, you know, weather patterns, I feel like, but not years. One of these days you'll find another talent. <laughs> so Tom Cruise in this movie, mm -hmm. 1999's Magnolia. Another person whose religious beliefs are not questionable. Don't worry about it. It's fine. There's nothing just generally off-putting about his, <laughs> his off-screen presence. What you should be focusing on is how symmetrical his face is if you ignore the teeth. Okay. I was going to say, he plays a like motivational speaker that's kind of like a vibe men's of a proto-men. Yeah, the proto-men's rights ac activist is kind of the vibe. I don't remember... That much. All I, the main thing I remember about this movie 
is that it was one of those movies mm-hmm. that people kind of used to define their taste mm. because it was cool to like it or it was cool to like appreciate it as one of their favorite films. And I hated this movie. And part of the reason that I hated it. <laughs> Go on. I mean, I have no opinions of it because I haven't seen it. So I'm enjoying just watching yeah. event. Well, so the approach to this movie was like, this is the kind of movie that I would like, especially at the time, because it was supposed to be a little heady. It was supposed to be mm. a little bit unexpected. It's a train. We live okay. in Nashville. There are trains. And it was like a common thing. And people that I ran with that they loved this movie because it was like that kind of movie. And I saw it and it made me so mad in a way that I don't think like my reaction to it was too much. But it was because it's a movie that when other people like it so much and kind of recommend it and you're like, I thought it was stupid. And instead of examining whether that mattered or not, I instead would use it part of my personality to not like this movie mm. that I another would be charming, expected to like. Another charming thing. It's you, really beating just one as charming pretentious. aspect of a personality with another charming aspect of personality. Like my evangelical atheism in the early 2000s. Yeah. Just yeah. as charming as people who were evangelically religious. I've grown it out of some me, of that. Not all. I feel all like there's it. a lot of movies like that. I'm thinking of, oh no, I just had it. Now I'm lost it. This movie is not that similar to Fight Club, but it had the same sort of like, that same vibe definition. of like yeah. someone basing their personality around it. I was going to think of a two thousands example, and it slipped away. I had it perfect, and then we're making fun of Ohio she's all that for a probably bit. is what she's another all that was like. You know, classic. you know, the film heads were really into the she's all that. Mm-hmm. I think of Licorice Pizza today was like mm. I started getting exhausted. I have no qualms with Licorice Pizza. Also, a yeah. Paul Thomas Anderson is yes. that correct? Yeah, but. After a while, I got tired of straight white guys telling me how awesome licorice pizza was. Mm. Oh, I thought of the example. I was thinking of American Beauty, where American oh, Beauty okay. is a really well-made film, but after a while, you just got tired of hearing about how well-made it was. That's one we we'll definitely should revisit at some point, too, because I don't think that one has, for a lot of reasons, not just the involvement of Kevin Just because Spacey. of the sexual predator at the yeah. center of it. Plus his actual character, not just the actor himself. As Him Adrian getting Spoiler. revenge on his wife, who seems to be just trying real hard to make a living. Yeah. And then this movie has like a, a twist, and obviously we'll talk more about it, because I don't remember exactly what it is, but I remember being like, the sort of unexpected turn your expectations on its head thing can go well or it can go poorly. And for this, for me at the time, it went poorly. I have not seen it since the time I went and I made it a distinct part of my personality to not like it. So I, I hope that I'm wrong because I want to like things. <laughs> That's what I've always gotten from you. I think I know what the twist is. I don't want to discuss it now because I only know what it is. I don't know it in its context, if there is any. Yeah. One thing I know about this movie is, one, I haven't seen it. Two, I believe it's the last performance of Jason Robards. You probably know him from Broadway's The Iceman Cometh. Mm -hmm. You might Mm -hmm. also know him better from Parenthood, the movie, not the show. Oh. So he's the guy that plays banjo and had the arrow through his head? He plays Banjo-Kazooie, yeah. No, he. I think he plays the, the patriarch of this family in this movie. Okay. I think he's dying in this. As older people tend to do. What? Dad's coming for us all. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i haven't seen this the only thing this movie has touched in my life is that when netflix was still a company that sent you physical dvds mm-hmm. this was the last dvd they sent me okay and it sat on our actually i think i can genuinely say on our this was we your sling blade because that's single sling blade it was sat that one for me. on our dvd player forever in that cute little soft paper thing that they used to send the dvds in and it sat there forever. And the no only time I finally sent it back is when Tyler said, when Tyler, my now partner of 10 years, said, I want you to cancel the DVD subscription for <laughs> Netflix because the only reason you have it is because you still claim you're going to watch Magnolia. <laughs> and now, boy, Tyler's finally getting hoist with his own petard, isn't yeah, he? Yeah. It's like, ah, oh, see, if we had just kept it. The $300 I would have spent on Netflix subscriptions would have really paid off. And boy, does he look like an idiot. Yeah. Take that. I don't know. I just want to, because I haven't seen this movie, I'm just going to go off on a personality trait that I hate in myself, which is that. I love when you have rants that aren't based (laughs) on actually facts or experience. I have a legitimate problem if 
I discover that a movie is good or a show is good on my own, I will right. watch it immediately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If someone tells me to watch it, some switch flicks in my brain <laughs> and I will go to my grave never having watched it. <laughs> What's wrong with me? I have DVDs that are in my collection that people have given me, hey, I think you'd really like this. People who know me well, some people who don't know me well, but like, what's it to me? It's an hour and a half of my time. Just watch the movie. Even if you hate it, you get to complain about it, which I love doing. <laughs> but there's do this like, it's that. like homework. Like all of a sudden I have yeah. to do this thing and I have to have an opinion about it. What if it's just fine, DJ? What if it's just fine? What if the Forbidden Zone is just fine? And I have to tell John, hey. Hey. Yeah, it was all right. Sorry I kept your DVD for seven years, but it was just okay. I have a friend that recommended a movie, and I'm not going to say the movie because I don't want to feel Name the friend, bad. but don't name the movie. We don't want to shame the movie here, but <laughs> yeah. shame your friend. A key grip might be listening. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I said, he, he was like, you you got to watch this movie. You know, it was just one I missed. It wasn't like a huge thing. And I was like, okay, I'll rent it because we were going to be traveling. And I was like, okay, I'll rent it and watch it. And then I forgot to watch it or I was watching something else. And then so I was like, Lauren, I, I, wanted, I rented this so you could watch it. Do you want to watch it? And she was like, yeah, we had to turn it off. And so later <laughs> when he was like, did you ever end up watching it? I had to be like, couldn't do it, man. <laughs> Meaning I couldn't watch it i mean you you told him that you had to stop it halfway through yeah i was just like we couldn't finish it dj it's just not for me even if you edit it out of the show even if you bleep it out which people would love people love that what was the movie like i don't know if this is gonna ruffle any feathers but it was the book of eli with denzel washington yeah where he's yeah. like trying to save the bible yeah hey guys if there's an apocalypse <laughs> I'll tell you one book that you can just <laughs> leave behind. Here's that annoying atheist from the 2000s that no one wants to hang Here's out with. Here he comes. Here he comes. Leave the Bible behind. It's got some jams. Don't get me wrong. It's got some. Yeah. You got the it's Noah. Got some jams. Yeah. That's a fun one. I like, you know, the Battle of Jericho, Joshua. That's fun. Jonah? Ten Commandments is good. <laughs> but come on. Most of it is just this person begat this other jackass. And then, you know, then we stoned this woman for having her period. No one wants to read that. Would you please kill all of these Canaanites? Love <laughs> They're God. They're dirty people who are taking up the <laughs> land that you've never been in. Kill them. <laughs> Not that movie. We're going to watch Magnolia. <laughs> and we'll be right back. Watch along with us. We'll be back. Shoot, I need you to sell, sell me. Sell? No, can't do it. I need you to just sell me like... No, you. I just came up with something. You do what you were about to tell me to do. <laughs> I can't I can't even do an impersonation no, of Tell Tom the Cruise. people to respect the cock and tame the cunt. <laughs> tell them. Tell the I good people that. I, I want you to it. say it. I can't even pretend to do it. So what I can do, let's do it straight laced. I'm going to tell you, dear listener... That if you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash your child is an idiot and support the show. You can support it at different levels. You can support just a little bit and we'll get your name in the written credits a little bit more. We'll say your name at the end of the show and on up from there. So we well, really appreciate any support you can give or or none. Just keep listening. That's fine, too. I bet you Tom Cruise character. I can't remember Frank his character. Mackey. Name. Frank Mackey. Frank Mackey. <laughs> wouldn't say that. It's the only person's name who I actually hooked on to because they kept fucking saying it all the time. Yeah. But he wouldn't. You were Frank Mackey's father? Frank Mackey. He wouldn't be so cool about it like we are. Patreon.com slash your child's an idiot. No, he would scream it and hump the air. <laughs> we should do more humping in our promos. Air You know, we air really humping. should. I feel like people would hear it over the mics. <laughs> At least the way I do it. What? <laughs> and we are back. We watched Magnolia 1999. Damon's getting to <laughs> recap this movie. No, I, you know what? You know what? I'm going to take a recap. Brave. Picture this. A series of characters' lives tied together by mere coincidence. Or is it? Mm, That's the twist. There you go. That's going to serve us well when we start diving into those characters. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's basically a bunch of stuff that happens. And then at the end, (laughs) 
we really learn a lesson about how all things are all connected because we wrote a script that connects them. So, oh, okay. go through our so you, whenever you take the reins, when you uh, gladly absolve me of having to recap, I know that you either loved the movie or hated it. <laughs> Getting the vibe now. Well, I carry Getting I, the vibe. As we discussed in the intro, I carry some some baggage with this movie. So I have a lot to say about it, but I think it's probably easiest to just kind of like go through characters, right? Because it's it is a very yeah, that's complicated a, I, th- I think that's a great idea. Story. So I mean there's a lot. I don't know if we have to cover every single character, but like the main storylines are we got Tom Cruise as oh what was his name again, Damon? <laughs> Frank T.J. Mackey. He's basically a pickup artist. Yeah. And this was at the beginning of that happening in society. So it was, it was very timely at the time, right? Because he was, Were he was you like, concerned that he wasn't wearing a piece of flair to catch a girl's eye? That's what I learned from watching VH1s that pick up artists. You always want to wear a furry top hat or a pair of goggles or, you know, a really bright colored headphones, something... <laughs> You want those a conversation piece. The, it's his hair. Want to his hair and the you. vest and the leather wristbands. He's got a ton of flair. What are you talking about? His padded underwear. Yeah. I was very distracted, but not in the usual way. I was like, I think you need to get that checked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the first like when we see him, he gets interviewed by a reporter, and he immediately because he's just come off stage of doing like his presentation, he strips down to just his underwear, and he's being very lascivious and gross. But then he does a real cool flip, which I was very impressed by. Because he still has a pants on around the ankles, yeah. and he still does a backflip or a front he flip, like one a, of the flips. I can't exactly describe what he does, but it is very good. And tell you what, Tom Cruise, 1999's Tom Cruise, keeping it toy. What was that? Keeping it toy. Oh, yeah, he was keeping it toy, indeed. I mean, that flip was, I think that's level 32, when you get the books. Right. <laughs> donate to the church. You got to have a certain amount of Thetans to do a flip like that, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> or not very many things. I can't remember which one. If Are I'm supposed to be gaining them or losing good them. Good or bad, I don't know. It's a well-researched religion. <laughs> They all yeah, he was keeping it tight. I did have I had a meeting of some homosexuals last night, and I did mention <laughs> I conveyed that. a meeting. <laughs> hear ye, hear ye. <laughs> Come to order. <laughs> John F. Kennedy. I never knew. <laughs> and I was saying that Thomas Cruise could get it in his mm. 1999 era. Yeah. And they found him very disgusting and gross. At the time? Yeah, they were like, oh, but didn't you, what about Top Gun? I'm like, I'm not discounting Top Gun. I'm talking about, I watched Magnolia last night and I'd like to talk about how hot Tom Cruise was at the time. The gays didn't agree? A gay. I will leave him his name off of my lips. Out of respect for him, I'm going to pull a Joe Biden State of the Union. Out of respect for him, I'm not going to sure. name names. <laughs> but he wants to cut Medicare, and he didn't find Tom it, Cruise and Magnolia very hot. It was Governor Rick Scott. <laughs> <laughs> that son of a bitch. <laughs> and Frank Mackey's <laughs> father is also a character in this. I can't remember his character. I'm Jason gonna... Robards. <sighs> Come on, little big league fan over here. Can't yeah. recognize Jason Robards when he's dying right in front of you? <laughs> I might need you to look up these character names because if I open another tab, apparently my camera goes all crazy. Oh, okay. I've got it already open over okay. here. So don't you, you might worry need to guide about us that. through this. You can mm-hmm. be the Sherpa through the characters of Magnolia. Remember, names. I have an ability of remembering C list actors' names. So, as Tyler will tell me to stop talking during episodes of Murder She Wrote so that he can watch the fucking episode, please. Wow, Robert Loja. <laughs> wow, John Aston in the second episode? Jason Robards plays Frank Mackey's dying father, Eric Partridge, for erstwhile TV producer. We find out very quickly near, I don't know. Where in the wasteland of this movie, in the in like the second or third hour, somewhere in there, Philip Seymour Hoffman plays the uh, <laughs> caregiver for his father. Phil Parma. That's his character's name. Phil Parma. All the main characters are named after cheese. I don't know if you picked up on that. Parma. Phil Parma. No, that's not oh. true. <laughs> DJ, <laughs> your that, face. Let me stop you right there. <laughs> that seems like something that would happen in this movie, though. That's why you got me. <laughs> that's how they're connected. There's like the themes. Anyway, Partridge is a British cheese maker. Mm, wonderful. That's why Partridge and a pear tree. It's just a pairing. It's a nice pairing with a pear mm-hmm. and a and a, and partridge a slice cheese. of yeah partridge blue. Mm-hmm. Julianne Moore plays his wife, Linda. Linda, Linda Parma. Yeah, not Parma. Linda Partridge. Mm-hmm. 
And who else do we have? John C. Riley Playing Officer Jim. Yeah, his character. And we've got an entire Philium H. Muffman. Ah, uh, yes. It's rare to get the set, and I like that. We got the power couple, the Bonnie and Clyde of college admissions <laughs> scandals. <laughs> William H. Macy and Felicity Huffman. Although they're not together in this. They're not they, together he, in this. They're just both yeah. in this. And they're both here. William H. Macy is a main character in this, and Felicity Huffman's just uh, said she's like a producer on the uh She's the a producer on a quiz show, one of the most deranged quiz shows ever committed to film. Yeah. William H. Macy is a... Former winner. It's a, it's a, <laughs> just saying the premise sounds weird. It's a quiz show where adults versus kids. There's a team of kids, team of adults. It's called What Do Kids Know? WDKK.com if you mm. want. Felicity Huffman is a producer on there and William H. Macy won back in the 60s. Yeah. So he's kind of riding that high still. The show is produced by Eric Partridge. Yes. And That's host the connection. Hosted by Jimmy Gator. Is that his name? Jimmy Gator. Jimmy yeah. Gator? The names do like almost cross that line into the arrested development. No one's actually named Pancake and no one's actually named <laughs> Gator. Please stop. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy Gator is Philip Baker Hall, a uh, character actor I, I really enjoyed. <laughs> Detective Bookman from <laughs> Seinfeld. He's in a number. I think if you looked him up, if you don't recognize that name, if you looked him up, you'd be like, oh, yeah. That guy, yeah. There's a kid contestant. Stanley. Stanley. Actually, I have to look him up because I think he stopped acting. Acting. Yes. Yeah, I got He started that. being real. <laughs> stopped <laughs> acting nice. <laughs> Jimmy Gator's daughter, Claudia, plays, she's a cocaine addict, or she's going through an a- addiction to ca- cocaine, and it's estranged from her father, and she has a whole storyline with John C. Riley's cop character. Yes, Melora Walters plays Claudia, Jimmy Gator's daughter, estranged daughter. Jeremy Blackman plays Stanley, the kid on the show currently. Yeah. And then there's uh, Stan- Stanley's father, who I don't know if we got his Oh, <laughs> yes. Hold on. I got Michael Bowen. You might remember him as the owner of the Pussy Wagon from Kill Bill. Ah, Buck, yes. who likes to fuck, as he uh, told mm-hmm. his comatose patients. He's great. Not a major character, but Clark Gregg is in there very quickly. Clark Gregg, I please. Recognize him. <laughs> there were so many times where hey, Tyler was guy. in the other room and I would pause it just to yell a name at him. Clark Gregg. Clark Gregg is in it. <laughs> Luis Guzman is in it. Playing himself, apparently. Playing <laughs> apparently himself. Pat Oswalt is in the very beginning very of the beginning. movie. Henry Gibson, you might remember him from The Burbs. He was mm. Bernard Klopek. Is at the. Be- you might also know him from Laughing. If my father's listening, he's like a bar fly. He's the, he's that. He's guy, a right? yeah. yeah, possibly a competitive suitor for the looks of the, the braced. I can't remember the name of the bartender, but the cute the bartender braced. with braces. Ron Popeil, two appearances, pre-taped, of course, archival footage, as uh-huh. IMDb would call it, <laughs> from his pasta, I believe it's the pasta maker infomercial, if I uh, if I know my infomercials. And you do, for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, I mean, that's the major characters, right? Did I miss anybody? Did I miss anybody? I say I, I was just, I was like just stumbling through characters while you read them off of the list. <laughs> You did mention Tom Cruise, right? I did. That was the that was the first one. I, I did one of the first ne- ones I mentioned. Thank you. Though. Neglect to mention the the star of this show, the main character, which is the music of Amy Mann. Yeah, yeah. I would like to devote a section to the soundtrack. Let's go ahead and start there because the movie certainly does. Whew. Don't so, forget Alfred Molina, by the way. Oh was yeah, in here as well. Once again, just doing a doing an accent. Just doing an accent. Look. I don't know if it's uh, kosher to be doing that accent. And don't forget, also, I mean, this was the one that, that blew me away, was Danny Wells is in this. Now, you may not recognize that name, but you might re- realize that he is the first live-action performer of a certain Luigi <gasps> from the Mario Brothers Super Show when we were kids. I can't believe I didn't Played remember Luigi. that because I was very much hooked on the brothers. Brothers. <laughs> brothers. 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 <laughs> Back in the zeitgeist, that rap for some reason. I mean, not for some reason, because it's part of a million dollar marketing campaign. Uh I'm glad that one did. I enjoyed that. It's a good ad. I don't want to, you know, just because we have this podcast where we like call out nostalgia and be like, was this movie really good? I fall for all of it. So yeah, that's why we're fucking doing it. We're morons. (laughs) 
Just in case anybody's under the impression that we think that we're above any of this. Yeah, I'm a sucker for that and needle drops in trailers. Mm -hmm. That's another one of my guilty pleasures. I'm like, wow, they really worked in Yellow Brick Road in here. Good job, Elton John (laughs) and whoever slowed down the beat. I can't, I can't believe they finally trailerized Lady in Red. I really appreciate that. It's really hit me in the feels. Wow, it's really creepy now. I see what you did. Yeah, when you when you single out the vocals and make a kid sing it, it is really terrifying. That woman's wearing red. Do you get it? Do you get the reference? Do you see? She's covered in blood. Are you picking up on it? You see? Blood is red. Is that an actual trailer? No, I just made that one up. I was trying to think of the most absurd song to be trailerized that I could think of. I'm sure there's... Just a really quick aside. Yeah. Lady in Red was used in a Weight Watchers commercial in the 2000s when I was what I would call in between jobs. And (laughs) it was a mainstay of the late night television, say the two in the morning block. (laughs) And it would just... Sometimes it would play after itself. And I was... I've hated that song ever since. Yeah. Because the whole premise of the commercial was a woman ate a bunch of frozen Weight Watchers meals, and now she can fit into a red dress. And she would spin around in the foyer of her apartment while her roommate was like, ah, and it was all played straight. Like it was all earnest beyond belief. I'm like, this commercial is ludicrous. (laughs) And the fact that I have to hear, Lady Every fucking 30 seconds, I wanted to shove the TV out of the window. But it might have been a lot of my own psychological issues at the time. I wonder if that's why I hate, you know, like sometimes, because no one's like curating the YouTube ads. They're like coming in the middle of sentences and videos and they're like the oh, same I video twice in a row or whatever. The late night TV in the late 90s is That's maybe why it gets so much on my nerves because it reminds me of that. Like when at night they're like, I don't know, they bought 11 ad slots. Just throw them all in a row. (laughs) We have, just to keep talking about this, because we certainly don't need to get to this three hour movie. (laughs) We have smart TV like set up on our, (laughs) set up on our Samsung television set. And there are all these pre-programmed channels. Some are good. Some are straight up garbage. And they've taken the YouTube system of commercials and just incorporated it straight into television. So that system where someone's like, and then you put it in the oven for four, and then it's immediately a flea commercial six times in a row until I am questioning my own sanity. And it's about the dog is singing, he's got fleas, he's at camp. I'm like, I would kill a child (laughs) if you could guarantee that this would not play again. And then it comes back to, you know, Julia in the America's Test Kitchen kitchen going, hours. And then once it turns golden brown, you know it's done. You're like, I have since moved on, Julia. (laughs) I forgot how many hours, Julia. So apparently our dear friend, whose name I can't, I'm blanking on right now, the director of this film. Oh, Paul Thomas Anderson. Mr. Maya Rudolph. Yeah, apparently Paul Thomas Anderson was listening to... Amy Mann and was like, I am going to write around this. And that's the inspiration for this movie, which, okay. But also (laughs) he decided the music is so important to me that I want it louder than anything, not only in the movie, but possibly than anything has ever been. (laughs) I also want to play it when other music is also playing, mostly because if a character walks into a bar where there's diegetic music playing, I still Just want Amy Man playing on top of it. And then also have conversations with different characters. That'd be great. He's like, I want to see DJ Phillips. I want to see his brain melt out of his ears. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly what happened. What is your feeling generally on Amy Man and her music? Not as a person, but like as an artist. I'm not a big her. fan. I don't hate her by any means. I've I think I have one album that a uh, erstwhile lover had given me and it was fine, but yeah. it wasn't my thing. I do appreciate she actually is really funny. She pops yeah. up in funny yeah. things a lot. She does lose her toe in the Big Lebowski and in part of a ransom scheme. But I'm not a huge fan. I do like her voice. She has a very specific voice and when I hear it I recognize I'm like I know that one. I know that one. Yeah. I'm that Leonardo DiCaprio meme that the kids were all too recently using. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't hate her by any means, 
But it was a very specific choice to use her very much. Yeah, she's a she's, movie. She's another. I feel basically the same way. I'm glad she's out with her there doing her thing. She seems cool, but and it seems cool to like her. You know what I mean? At, or it did at a time, but it's never like been a big thing for me. I like some of these songs that are in the movie, but they're just like I'm watching a movie right now, so I need to hear what people are saying. <laughs> and some of that is maybe, you know, like, I don't know if it's, I don't actually remember this being somewhat of a problem. Like it came back to me as I was watching this, but I'm sure the sound and my own little home setup is part of the problem. So I'm not going <laughs> to enti- entirely blame it on them, but I was like, I don't know what's going on. It was, my note is Jesus, the soundtrack is nonstop. And it literally is. I think there is music playing throughout the entire first act of this movie. So like the first hour of this movie, up until literally the moment when Jimmy Gator, Phillips Baker Hall, too many Phillips. With three names. Yeah, too many tri-named Phillips. uh, When he says, and that's the end of round one, and the music suddenly stops. Like it's a conscious choice to like have this cacophonous music playing throughout the entire first act. At first, I thought it was my problem. I don't think I hated it, but I thought I was missing something or that like something was wrong or my TV setup was just, you know, finally coming to back to bite me in the butt. But once I sort of realized, no, this is a conscious choice, I didn't hate it. It keeps the tension like constantly ratcheting in this movie, yeah. which makes this movie very stressful to watch, even though it's a very, it's not low stakes by any means, but it's an emotional movie up until its climax. It's not like an action packed yeah, movie. It's a it's, lot of like it's world almost is small, like, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, it's almost like play like yeah. ex- aside from its scope. And so the fact that this music just keeps playing and sort of ratcheting up increases this tension in me. It reminded me, I don't did you ever see We Need to Talk About Kevin? Yes. That movie, I mean, it's not the same in the How It's soundtrack, but that movie is like tattooed in my brain because that movie has no points of levity. It has no like comic relief. It is just constantly stepping up a mile high ladder. It is so tense for me. And I remember leaving the theater being like, oh my God, I didn't even realize like how tense I was until I actually was able to leave and calm down. And this movie is a little bit like that in that, although not as completely intense as Kevin, also with John C. Riley. I remember just watching the first act and just feeling Yeah, that's true. And I they reinforce that with, t- with muscles the, seize up. With the the weather, because it's like really rainy and then right. the weather kind of comes in. More over and noise, over. by the way, the rain hitting the windows. Yes. Yeah. And then it's one of the many like kind of through lines is the the music. Because they also at some point it becomes an Amy Mann video where they're all singing It's not go and the characters literally sing it with along with music and they're all singing at the same time and that's a choice (laughs) but you know the idea is that they're connecting so there's all these reasons and and uh, apparently sorry i killed damon (laughs) oh my god i'm so i like even turned off my mic to not distract you and then completely tried to derail the entire podcast you're like it's a disease i can't (laughs) i'm like i can't help you go get help oh my god anyway i've called an ambulance it's on the way to your house have i ever told you the story when i was i was at work i was making a call with a coworker, and possibly i don't know yet you gotta tell me more (laughs) and uh he was dialing the number because he knew a little bit more about the subject than i did so i was like can we call this guy and just clear up the the questions and after he like finishes dialing the last number i'm like oh and by the way he has a bit of a marble mouth and shay the coworker, looked at me and then the person we were calling answers the phone, yeah, it's David Hunter. And Shay lost it. Like, why did I say that then? And so all of a sudden, Shay ha- cannot talk. <laughs> like, he has, like, put his head down in his arms. And I have to talk about DNS changes or whatever the fuck. And I'm the, the reason that Shay's here is to talk about those things. I can't talk about them. <sighs> Self-sabotage is what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> That's why every time you say some weird word right before we record, every time, just to throw me off. <laughs> I want the podcast to fail. Like, onomatopoeia. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> really got in my head, though. Amy Mann is very specific. And it's like, 
<laughs> Lauren pointed out that she's like, do you think Amy Mann likes this movie? Like, what if she was like, hey, Amy, I uh, I made a movie around your song. And she's like, great. Like, I'm sure she's happy for the the money. But what if she doesn't care for this movie? That That'd would be, be really great. Well, sometimes maybe it's one of those things where eventually, you know, William Shatner is tired of being asked by, about Star Trek. Maybe that this is her, you know, Star oh, Trek. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. Especially this movie. Where she's movie. like, okay, after, yeah. you know. yeah. By 2009, she's like, you know, I've done other things. Yeah. I've written more than the two songs you heard in the Magnolia soundtrack, one of which is One is the Loneliest Number. It's not even my song. <laughs> if I were going to write a movie around this time, it would be Bare Naked Ladies. It would be like, <laughs> be like, your father is dying. It's been <laughs> one. <laughs> wow. Do you remember that scene? <laughs> And they all just started singing, If I Had a Million Dollars. It was really sweet. Because when John C. Riley comes into Claudius, he'd be like, I'm broken to the old apartment. <laughs> and I'd be like, Ed Robertson, I, I wrote this movie about your work. He's like, yeah, thanks. He's like, yeah, that's great. We did the theme song for Big Bang Theory. We clearly don't give a shit. <laughs> Well, let's, since we're sort of in this realm, like, let's talk about the magical realism. You talked about the music video. How did you feel about that music video moment? I thought it sucked. It took me out and more than sort yeah. of connecting me to the characters. I came in trying to be fair to this movie because I like have this residual dislike of it. And I was trying <laughs> to be like, maybe I was wrong, right? But most of it came back. I did. There's some really compelling character work here. That moment, if it had worked for me, I think I get what was what was the goal there, you know. I think what he was going for, the connection between the characters, tying it into the music, the sort of buying the sort of magical realism of it. I can see the goal. It just didn't work for me. I, I what about you? I was surprised because it seems like a very sad sack a thing to do is like, what if they're all just singing the same song, man? But it worked on me. I don't know why it worked on yeah. me. Maybe because by that point I'm Two hours and change with these characters Delirious. and it's like Stockholm Syndrome. But it's a good song. I don't know. It is. And yeah. I feel, I don't know, they're all sort of at their wits end at that point, And they're sort of repeating the same mistakes they've made in the past or repeating mistakes from people who have hurt them. Yeah. And they're now completing that cycle. I don't know. It's very, it worked for me, despite my noted levels of cynicism yeah. um i i found it working i don't know if i can vocalize why it worked for me and maybe if it hit me on a different day it would not have worked for yeah. me but it did work there was an amping like i think because of the choices made in filming this movie even though nothing is truly out of the ordinary in the first two thirds of the movie the amping up of everything like we've talked about with the with the music and just how the movie is filmed where you're just jumping from storyline to storyline without any rhyme or reason sometimes it feels yeah. like. And having this moment where everyone sort of chills out for a moment and sings the song together. I don't know. It works for me. Julian Moore, like mid overdose singing it <laughs> is, reminds me of like <laughs> yeah. the dead frog. Like, hello, my baby. Hello. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's like, it's not supposed to be realistic in that moment. It's like hyper realism, but still, it's just, it didn't work for me. You know, not everything was like that. Like we're in these moments where we're leading up to that, like you said, on a, a broader level, but like, you know, Stanley is being, he was forced to stay on stage when he had to pee and he pees himself on national television. It's really this really like dark moment. He's like, doesn't want to do this anymore. And he realizes like the pressure that's on him and all this stuff. And that reflected with, William H. Macy's character, who already went through all of that as a kid and now is trying to like individually those beats. I'm like, I get, I feel like I was there emotionally. And instead of enhancing that, it was like too much pepper on your dinner. You know what I mean? It was like, <laughs> which is weird. I, it's weird for me personally because I like the song and I don't mind that idea and I don't mind kind of using the music that way, but it just. I just don't think there was enough of that weird shit before that point of the like a hyper weird stuff. Like it was, it's always, it's a weird movie, right? It's yeah. kind of got that uncomfortableness, but that was the first time that was like, oh, okay, this is what we're doing. There, there was no other moment. And I think that's meant to be like, yeah, because it's this tense moment that's going to bring everybody together. You, if you had done it before, it would have lost its impact. But for me, it made me go like, okay, we're changing. <laughs> so this is a different movie. This is a different kind I do of think movie. it is. 
it is a fault line in the movie where as we're like gearing up for this final act, this is where everyone is sort of about to do something drastic. Like this is right before I think William H. Macy goes to break into his, the store he was fired from. I think this is right before Philip Seymour Hoffman gives the liquid, what's it? Morphine. Morphine Mm -hmm. to Jason Robards. And of course, I mean, Julia Moore is already overdosed on her own cocktail. And I don't know. Yeah, it's this sort of like tipping point where I feel like it's almost like rather than a culmination of magical realism, it's this point where the movie's like, and now it's going to get weird. Now we're going to do some weird stuff. So I'm just going to easy into it with some, I don't know, let's just pick a random artist here, Amy (laughs) Mann. I will say what really did make me enjoy the character built a little bit more was William H. Macy listening to dreams can come true. (laughs) (laughs) Tyler noticed this. He was like, have we heard this song already before that? He noticed that William H. Macy was only listening to this one song by UK artist Gabrielle called Dreams, as you'd expect it to be, just constantly on the radio. Dreams, always. <laughs> what is this? The All Dream Station? I didn't notice that. I was about to say I did notice that. Tyler noticed that and told me that I should now notice that. Can we talk about this quiz show? Because that to me was insane. <laughs> I feel like the main things we need to talk about are old guy dying, quiz show, <laughs> and John C. Riley's dealing. This quiz show. It is called, yes, we said it's What Do Kids Know? Apparently it's been running since at least 68 when William H. Macy's character go. But we do see like brief clips, which make it seem like it's been on television for fucking ever. And the premise, as I said, is like adults versus kids. The questions are insane. They start out as trivia questions. I'm like, oh yeah, Willa Cather, I can do this. And then immediately they start to go off the rails after that. At first, they're just like reciting facts, normal trivia stuff. The second round is they are going to play three notes and the notes will spell something that you might find at a picnic. What? (laughs) (laughs) So what was the first one? One was, the first one was A-D-E. Oh, yeah. And that's lemonade. lemonade. And then egg, I think was one. Egg, E-G-G. Yeah. And I think B was the last one we yeah. hear. I don't think we actually hear B, but that someone says B. The next one is classical music, <laughs> classical music played on harmonicas. And you had to guess it. <laughs> it was like a group of, one of harmonica, a harmonica yeah, ensemble. harmonica players playing Maurice Ravel's like bolero. <laughs> and then at one point there was a bonus question where he read the lyrics from an opera in English and you had to give it to us the- French or the, the original the language. language yeah. and the opera. And for extra points, sing it. you had to, you could sing the original lines. And it was like a line from, Car- like the famous song from Carmen. It's what is this game? And I like that the kids on Stanley's team, dead weight, just absolutely they, they terrible nothing. kids. They were useless. And they were also both stage kids. Like yeah. they wanted to they wanted to use this to break out into movies. MOWs, movie of the week. And dad, uh, Stanley's dad also is seeing, I mean, definitely, of course, like the easiest comparison to make is, is William H. Macy's character and Stanley, because William H. Macy, one, had all his winnings taken from his parents and they spent it and he, yeah. he didn't get shit. And I think they sort of, turned him into this life of like using his quiz show fame, which I'm like, I guess Ken Jennings would be the most appropriate comparison, maybe. They turned his quiz show fame into him like doing commercials to make even more money. And that's how he's sort of in the bind he is in where he works for this electronics company, electronics depot that hired him as a celebrity. Stanley, his dad, obviously is more invested in getting the money than Stanley is. Yeah. We know that he's like a struggling actor himself. He gets really very emotionally abusive and a little physical with Stanley when he finds out that Stanley's not answering the questions because he's pissed himself. Also, you can't like rely on your kid being smart to win money and then be angry that he has four book bags. Those, you can't do that. You can't, you can have one or you can have the other. You can't have both. <laughs> Sorry, Stanley's dad, Stanley Sr. Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to add about the quiz show because it's just, I mean, we've got, of course, also happening there is Jimmy Gator the, is the host and he has learned he has cancer. And so he's starting to like, he passes out. He's at also some point. drunk. Like he's he mentions drunk. that yeah. he's hammered. Yeah. And he wants to kind of, 
make up with his estranged daughter who is dealing with uh, addiction to cocaine. And also it turns out he molested her, we learn later. Yeah. So that's not good. Right. But so, yeah, we've got even within the quiz show set, you've got that tension between those, especially those three characters where Stanley is kind of dealing with the full on embarrassment. His dad's in the dressing room, like yelling at him and then eventually coming out and yelling at him. And then Jimmy threw a like, chair in like the green room. Yeah. And it was bragging about how abusive he is with the other parents. You got to be kind of abusive to get him to do what, what you want. I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. Yes. And I mean, that right. does pair with Gator, with Claudia Gator. That's sort of one of the big reveals at the end. Is that her last, is her last name Claudia Gator? <laughs> well, she goes by, I think, her mother's maiden name is the vibe I got. I mean, the movie is almost entirely exclusively about not exclusively, but one of the big themes is fathers mm -hmm. throughout the film. Not parents, but fathers and their kids and that relationship. And, you know, I mean, DJ, you witnessed me cry at a cat litter commercial with a daddy <laughs> cat and a yeah. little boy cat. So susceptible. No need to look into it, but I am susceptible <laughs> to it. Yeah, that's I mean, that's the big reveal with Claudia's his daughter. Jimmy Gator's daughter, it's, that, that's the big reveal is later we learn that he actually did molest her. And then, of course, he tries to tries to kill himself, but then doesn't, but then does. And, does he? I, actually, well, wait. it's implied that, okay, so to spoiler alert, there's a reign of frogs later and Jimmy's <laughs> about to shoot himself. We've been dancing around it for some reason, yeah. being cagey. <laughs> well, I do definitely want to talk about it, but I, I'm not ready to like exclusively talk about it. Kind of running low on time. We'll, <laughs> we'll have get to, to save it. the frog discussion for another movie. <laughs> we'll, we'll just... We, <laughs> we'll tack it on to DuckTales when we, do when we get on, around we'll, to it. We'll get to it. <laughs> but as he's trying to shoot himself, the frog hits him and he misses, or hits the gun and or hits his hand. Hits and, Ron Popeil, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, and he shoots the TV. But in doing so, it triggers a like a short in the wire. And it, like, it is implied, we don't see like he died, but it is implied that like the house catches fire and that he probably still dies. Which it ties to the story at the beginning. We didn't really talk about this at the very beginning of the movie. Before we see any of our characters, we decide to list a bunch of debunked chainmail things. <laughs> yeah, there's all these happenstance coincidences, and the movie is sort of saying there are no coincidences. Are no coincidences. Things ha these things happened. Featuring Miriam Margulies, one of my favorite uh, British character actresses, she plays the mother who shoots. And the son mm. who's committing suicide out the window, she yeah. accidentally shoots him. Miriam Margulies is great. She does not know how to censor herself. So if you ever get a chance to go down a YouTube vortex of Miriam Margulies on panel shows, mwah, mwah, mwah. <laughs> could just eat it like a slice of watermelon at a country fair. It's... <laughs> Truly amazing, dropping C bombs and F bombs, telling crazy sexual stories that don't seem real, but I love her. I God, I love her. But back to the topic at hand. We also see Patton Oswald to get as a scuba diver who got sucked up by a plane gathering water to put out a forest fire nearby. Yeah, didn't happen. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> this whole movie didn't happen. <laughs> but those are, I feel those like are that's, presented that's, as like, these things really happen. And right. They were, yeah, tied together. But how? Yeah. And did you get the feeling that the kid who was watching Miriam Margulies get arrested was Ricky Jay, who was our narrator of this whole thing and also the producer of Jimmy Gator's show? Uh, I didn't. I didn't put that together. Like there's this weird shot in it where there's a kid who lives in the apartment building where yeah. the guy committed suicide is just watching and it's just the narrator talking at that moment. I think he's literally saying it would seem like this couldn't have happened, but it did happen. But it did. And it's a zoom in on this kid that we never see again and is never explained. And I, the second time watching, I was like, is that Ricky Jay? Because Ricky Jay is narrating. He plays the producer. Is that Ricky Jay's character? Movie didn't want me to know. No, no. Shall we talk about frogs? Before we get to frogs, I want to talk about Sorry. Tom Cruise and his and his father. So, well, and tangentially. Oh, right. Fathers in general. I forgot we were yeah. talking about fathers. I don't know why I wanted to change the subject so quickly. <laughs> why would why would that be sensitive? I need a moment with <gasps> myself. Just want to touch on it real quick because Philip Seymour Hoffman is a very gifted actor and I'm sad that he's gone. And it's yeah. nice to see him play like a genuinely nice, good character. Because I feel like <laughs> not that he's ever playing or he's always playing the worst people, but it's like is usually like a little bit of 
something off about the characters he plays and <laughs> he might be a priest who molested a kid or not <laughs> just a little he, something off that's not the one i was thinking <laughs> of when i said that well brant brant and big lebowski he's a good guy brant is maybe a little uptight brant means well but yeah there's something not right about that guy brant is what i love about brant in the big lebowski is that he he's one of the <laughs> he's always very tense but he does call the dude Dude. Yeah. Like of all the sort of uptight people, he is now dude. <laughs> we can't know that. <laughs> Which I always find as a weird deference that he has yeah. towards the dude. Respectful. But yeah, he plays Phil, the caretaker of you know, Jason Robards. Yeah, Eric Partridge. Yeah, Eric Partridge. And Eric just, Partridge? Is that right? I don't know. I just repeated what you said. I don't know. <laughs> Alan uh, Partridge? <laughs> I don't no, think that's, that's a different it. character. He genuinely cares about his patient. And Earl, he, by Earl the way, Partridge. sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Say it again. He, Earl Partridge, though. He, Earl. He genuinely cares. And he even like when it's clear that Earl's life is near the end, he decides to stay on. He's like really upset and crying at the end. And he's not doing it because he thinks he's going to make money from the will or anything. He's just doing because he cares about his patient. And I, I don't know. It's nice. Nice. He kisses him on the head when he arrives and when he leaves. Yeah. Like at first I was like, oh, is he a son who's just a nurse? Oh, no, it's his caretaker. They do have a very cute relationship. Earl Partridge and Phil. Phil. Why can't I remember his, his name? His is name. The, it's the Tony Danza <laughs> syndrome. Just that's his name. Phil's character, you know, he sort of is doing the crossword while Earl is in and out of consciousness. And then our Earl will say something like, do me a favor. And Phil's like... Is it go fuck myself? Yeah. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> Jason, I mean, you get the idea that he is a prick, much like Jimmy Gator. He reveals that he's a philanderer, cheated on his first wife, which is Tom Cruise's mother. Even though, you know, it seems like he genuinely loved her, he still cheated on her a lot. And he has, sort of has a confessional moment. There are a lot of confessional moments in this. His confessional moment is is revealing that and it's genuinely sweet. I like yeah. curmudgeons. With, and with hearts of gold. Yes. And he's sort of like giving life advice, you know, talking about regrets and that sort of thing. And he's giving it to Philip Seymour Hoffman, I think primarily because his son is not there. He's sort of, it felt like a, the way that the movie talks about it, it feels like a mutual thing where he doesn't want his son around and Frank does not want to be around. Because yeah. Linda, Julianne Moore's character, sort of talks about like Earl doesn't want any money to go to Frank. And that's one of the, she's sort of in a bind herself during her confessional moment. She reveals like she sort of married him to get his money and fell in love with him after the fact. And early in their relationship, she cheated on him a lot, sort of waiting him out to die and then fell in love with him. And she's in a bind because she knows that she doesn't want the money to go to Frank, but if she renounces the will because she feels very guilty about accepting this money now, that's where it'll go. It'll go to Frankie. Right. And I'm like, just donate the money. I don't know. Yeah, just, just donate it. Anybody. Give it to Phil. But yeah, and then- <laughs> We get the, I think, one of the most powerful sequences in this whole thing is, first of all, Tom Cruise's character. So Frank coming to- He's not playing a character named Tom, just to be yeah, clear. So that's you've what got threw Phil's me off. playing Phil's, but you also have Tom's playing Frank's. I think so. we've established that I have a maximum amount of three character names at once that can live in my brain. <laughs> and maybe also their actor names, Maybe. <laughs> Once you go beyond that, I can't do it. We get the first touching thing that, that happens is when he finally show he actually shows up, he says, I will drop kick those fucking dogs if they come near me. <laughs> Which he says it again too. Uh, it's he's very repeats it. Makes, specific. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I don't, you know, condone any sort of animal abuse, but as someone who of does not like don't. dogs or any sort of animals, like when they're sort of especially that is a lot of dogs and they didn't seem aggressive at all, but they did seem very jump on ya. There's a range of dogs over the course of the movie, no spoilers, but there's at least three to four dogs during the course of this movie in that, in Jason Robard's house. Chekhov's dead dog. I kept waiting for that dog. At one point, Philip what Seymour Hoffman- I missed that. He dies. I mean, they find him when they're, when they're carting Jason Robard's body yeah, out of the building. Like, they also take the dog with them. Yeah, I saw that. Which usually, I feel like it would be two different departments. One would get the dog and one would yeah. get the human body. But yeah, they discovered- so like We have this extra bag. It's sort of in the epilogue, which I was anxious about it the entire time. I'm like, when are we going to- Do Wait, I have to see the dog die? Why or did we just know gonna that be it dead? was going to die? I thought you were saying you missed the actual no, dead body. I saw that part. 
when Philip Seymour Hoffman is on the phone trying to get to Fred Mackey, and I guess he just calls that 1-800 number to actually call for the seminar as a last-ditch effort to get a hold yeah. of him, Jason Robards comes out of a stupor and starts screaming for his dead wife, screaming for his dead wife. And so Philip Seymour Hoffman is across the room. He runs to where the Valium is or whatever and knocks it over. Uh, onto the floor. Okay. And he's shooing all the dogs away while also trying to stay on the phone because I think he's actually on hold. So he's still trying to listen right. to see if Frank will be connected. And so he's gathering up these pills and one of the dogs like eats four, four okay. Valium. I think I missed, I just missed that. So I was like in this other state of tension, not related to the soundtrack for once of like, <laughs> do I have to see the dog die or is it just going to be dead? Thankfully, PTA saved me and I just had to deal with the dead dog body yeah and not have to like witness it die but we do get when tom chris the the scene where he comes and he finally like kind of actually has an emotional moment with his father by his uh, his bedside as he's dying he, he's there as he dies he probably has like a cogent moment where they i guess reconcile it's just more like i'm dying yeah i'm here you know maybe make peace i, yeah, I don't know make if that peace. yeah that, more that's kind of the appropriate kind of vibe that was really well done the acting the emotion of it like it was really really good that was yeah. brutal. it was brutal the whole thing because it, it had been this really long it's this really long process for the character dying it's been like obviously a long time coming but in his actual dying he has this long speech with philip seymour hoffman's character and like he's waiting for frank to come and then he's like clearly in like severe pain and he takes the dosage of morphine and so he's like kind of in and out and then as he's there dying like Oh man, it was just so long and brutal. And it reminded me a lot of actual <laughs> experiences of people <laughs> uh-huh. in my family who have had these like long extended. And it's just, that was not fun, but really well done. Yes, I agree. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it does remind me like, I don't shit on Tom Cruise. I know it's very easy to shit on him. What? And, you know, I think he's sort of become like almost a parody of himself in these later years, these Scientology forward Mission Impossible exclusive years. But he can deliver a performance like this, and it is fun to be reminded of that. Yeah. It was kind of amazing because it's been a long time since I've seen Tom Cruise really acting it up. Not a movie star, I guess. He's really in his movie star mode. And someone who looks like Tom Cruise. Go be a movie star, of course. Yeah. It is nice to be reminded, like, no, he can do it if given the opportunity. And he does a really fantastic job. It's also, I thought, and people might disagree, but it didn't feel like a very scripted moment, a very movie moment. He yeah. just sort of, like, blurts out a lot of things. Uh, he's very angry at Jason Robards. Even though he sort of has spiraled into becoming almost a parody of what we hear about what Jason Robard's character was like. He's angry at his dad for cheating on his mom. So he is a guy who like just talks about using women all the time and just yeah. sort of uses that to teach other guys to use women all the time. Just becoming the a hyper example of his father. Yeah. Uh, while also resenting his father for not being around while his mother was dying of cancer years earlier. It's an amazing scene. It's very well done. I think that's part of what I mean, I don't think I think all the acting in this part of why it's so powerful is because his character is like clearly has just created this huge barrier between real emotion persona. Yeah, yeah the persona and like this real wall around him of touching we we see glimpses of it in the interview where he gets asked questions about his mother and then it's clearly like that's starting to, to crumble and he's he becomes like you know he shuts down and then of course we see that just continue to crumble as the movie goes on the funny thing was during that interview yeah he's being interviewed by a female reporter Two things about that interview that I love is that she sort of flirts with him at the beginning. And I thought, oh, is she actually like being wooed by this asshole? Yeah. But no, she's doing it to get what she wants. Almost yeah. like a mirror image of like his technique, his seduce and destroy ugh, seminar. But then also I was reminded of when Tom Cruise went full Scientologist in the 2000s. And he would have these sort of contentious interviews. I was like... Yeah, I've seen this Tom Cruise before yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> he, yeah. 
He wasn't acting. Because as she sort of pokes hole, because he's not only created this persona, he's created a false history for this character right. of Frank Mackey, who's like a, a rags to riches story, who who didn't have enough money for college, but he had a, some professors who let him sit in on classes. And that's, so he's entirely self-taught. His mom's still alive and she supports him in everything he does. And his dad is dead. The reporter, you know, found out that, that was not true. And she calls him on it eventually, sort of. That's when she sort of drops her flirtatious persona and asks the questions she wants. That was really well done. Mm-hmm. Although yeah. PT, I wouldn't have known that that, that Tom was coming Cruise for would go actual Tom Cruise. Deep, yeah. The deep end uh, in you're 10 glib, years. You're he said. Remember when- you're so glib. Yeah. Psychology is a ruse. What a nice man. To be fair to Tom Cruise, that's how I learned the word glib. So (laughs) you're always learning. And that's the key to Scientology is it's about learning and education. Now, could you put your two hands on these rods, please? I would like to nominate Tom Cruise for the Sally Field Memorial single scene award for what's that for the for the for the the death death scene. scene. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I'll second that. All right, Greg, put it in the minutes. Seconded. You want to talk about frog right now? I'm ready. Yeah, it's time to get it out of the way, right? Wait, actually, before we get to frogs, let's leave that as our final thing. I want to talk about probably the one, this might have been where you were like, "Mm," when I said the acting was good. I think the part that probably is the least interesting to me, maybe the most uneven for me, and probably doesn't play well in this era we currently live in rather than 1999, although then I don't know if it would play well either in 90s Los Angeles, is fucking John C. Riley. And yeah. Claudia. Yeah, Claudia, Melora Walters. Their story is I don't know what the movie wants me to do with this story, but I didn't like it. Yeah, because it starts as a noise complaint. And so he's like showing up as a cop, but then he clearly has like a little, he finds her attractive and makes it. And he's it's a like, meat cute. Yeah, and that's real inappropriate. And he's even like, this is inappropriate, but I'd like to ask you out. But she's right. into it. But also, is she? Because she's just really nervous that he's going to discover her cocaine i've never even in a movie seen someone do so much cocaine in a 24-hour period yeah i don't know why i said even in a movie like everyone you know <laughs> that i'm just like in dens of I see sin all the more. time just having cocaine like it was ludicrous i'm like you're not even doing anything you're listening to amy man and you're alone in your apartment and you're doing just like line after line after line of cocaine i mean i know addiction and stuff yeah and I think so. Her performance is part of what is really not great for me. I do think it works for me later, like the the later, because you kind of like her character is supposed to be sort of nervous and awkward and an addict. And then also we find out like her family history and she's like got a history of abuse. So like you kind of like learn more that gives you context. But in the beginning, it's like. What am I watching a soap opera all of a sudden? <laughs> the acting between her and Philip Baker Hall, that first scene is like, this is bad. Yeah. It was that, that it scene a- was like, this is terribly done. And maybe it was like supposed to be over the top to kind of like set up this family drive. But I was like, it felt out of place because I do think the other, the acting overall is pretty good. No, I will disagree about Melora Walters. I think she does a great job, especially as you get that more information, yeah. like that first scene like is entirely colored. You're like, oh, of course. She's screaming at him to get, yeah. she's like completely terrified of this man probably. Right. It's very sad. She seems, yeah, she's addicted to cocaine and her relationship with John C. Riley. I feel like, I don't know if it's like almost like a parody of a meet cute and it's supposed to right. be just very awkward. You can't tell if she genuinely likes him or if she's just like going along with it because we also sort of see when we first meet her, she's in a bar and this kind of schlubby guy comes up to her and just says, Hey, yeah. And the next scene, you know, they're having sex in her apartment. And I feel like the movie is sort of insinuating like she seeks validation yeah. from anyone who will give it to her. And so we sort of maybe see that with her and John C. Riley. John C. Riley, he's not a, I mean, the movie's not portraying him as a terrible cop, but I mean. He wants to be a good cop. He wants to be a good cop. But the first thing we see is like him, you know, coming into another noise disturbance earlier where a woman has a dead body in her closet. Yeah. I never really fully pieced together that element, although that's part of the magical realism that will like yeah. go into when the, the kid end. That wraps and when the later, kid like, tells prophet him. tells him what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Anyway, and so you know he's responding to her noise complaint, which is 
he responds in a completely different way than he did with the black woman in the poor side of town than he does with this woman he wants to fuck. So that also like puts me on edge. And he's very caring and considerate towards her. And he just seems like kind of a boob and he maybe even worse than a boob. Like he seems kind of nervous, kind of like on edge. But when he's with certain people, he's dismissive and kind of rude, particularly the people of color he encounters as a cop. Yeah, he calls the little kid like homie and yeah, Coolio and Ice things. Tea. Yeah. I mean, he the kid is rapping at him, yeah. ludicrously. I'll add, yeah. um, he doesn't call him ludicrous. No, too early. Yeah. No, it would have been right on time. Yeah. <laughs> he does. <laughs> uh, uh, John C. Reilly character does give one of my favorite lines is because <laughs> she doesn't know how loud the music is, and he says, "Well, that right there is the first sign of hearing loss." Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> then he like asked her out on a date and she almost still seems thrown off and she's laughing while also seemingly crying. I will add that Melora Walters has a voice. She has a very specific voice where it always sounds like she's about to cry. Yeah. <laughs> because she was also, she played one of the parents on Pen15, one of my favorite shows from the last few years. And she just sort of has sort of a, a wispy, sort of gravelly voice that always just sounds like she's either just finished or is about to cry, which works really well, I think, in her performance here. But it makes you constantly like on edge of what, it does she actually like I have trouble understanding her inner life just because partly because the movie is deliberately withholding it but yeah. it makes their encounters all the more I don't want to say fraught because that seems like more intent than I think the movie intends to give it yeah it just makes their relationship kind of seem off and in a way that makes me uncomfortable but not in a meaningful way it's yeah. just sort of but they go on a date and she, you know, initiates a kiss after doing some coke in the bathroom. And then she leaves, right? She abandons him. She runs off because he's alone when it, things get biblical later. Yeah. Do they get back together in the epilogue? I can't remember. No, he does. He comes He comes back and visits her yeah. with her mother. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if the movie wants me to think this is as cute because he seems to be ignoring everything she's saying to him. Right. I feel like she is clearly going through something and she's like trying to explain to him her problems. And he seems to just be sort of dismissing them by like, oh yeah, I'll listen to you. No, yeah, I'm a great guy. I think if you get to know me, it'll be great. I'm like, dude, yeah. I feel like you're not listening to what she is saying. But yeah. I don't know if the movie realizes <laughs> that he's not listening to her. I think we got his character right. You know what I mean? That he's uh -huh. like kind of a loser, but he's not a bad guy, but he's also not a good guy. He wants to be a good guy, and he, he gets his moment to be a good guy when the frogs rain down and knock Philliam H. Muffman off the- 50% of Philliam H. Muffman. Yeah, knock him the down, half was and not he, present. he drags him under the awning to kind of get him out of harm's way. He gets his hero moment. Right. When he's not in a cop uniform, I might add. Right. Well, that's some commentary. Write it down, Greg, in the minutes. Did you get all that? The uniform thing. I don't know if like what the percentage of it is intentional, but some certainly some of it is intentional because he's he's not being like this cop rules. You know what I mean? There's definitely not that <laughs> happening. I want to walk back some of my. It's really just that scene that bothers me. But you're right. The the like later revelation of her father molesting her as a as a child is like it does kind of color that scene a little bit. But I think it was just the way it was and when it came in the movie. Made me go like I felt like I was watching a different movie all of a sudden. It does get colored by the the way what we find out, you know, about yeah. the relationship. The amount of cocaine, yeah, and I'm not a cocaine <laughs> user, cocaine. but the amount of cocaine she does when just watching infomercials is a lot. Come on, tell us, you know, I, I'm familiar with like cocaine users who just won't stop talking. And, uh, you know, telling you how funny and beautiful they are. I'm not familiar with cocaine users just hanging out at home. Like, she does a lot of coke, but acts like she's stoned. Like, I'm very confused. Hey, cocaine users, Speak let up. us know. You're in Charles and Idiot at gmail.com. Is this accurate? Is this a normal amount of cocaine to do over the course of the day? Send us a, leave us a voicemail, 615-576-0525. <laughs> we will say your name and uh, give your address to the cops on the show. Thin blue line. <laughs> We stand with the cops. I also, another thing, I mean, I think this is intentional, but John C. Riley is narrating to himself, which is something I do and I've done since a kid, but it was very much 
cops. Mm-hmm. Like he's narrating to an unseen, like imaginary cops producer while what he's driving he around Los Angeles. Oh, he's driving around. At the beginning and at the end, when he gives the famous, famous, I don't know if it's famous, the forgiveness speech. Tyler's coming home. Probably doing a lot of cocaine. Tyler's coming. It's not going to stop. Hey, DJ, someday can we sing Amy Mann? We don't sing it to each other. I'll text you. You'll hit play. And then we'll just sing it alone to ourselves while sort of looking wistfully at the floor. Yeah. If you ever just text me now, I'll do it. I'll know that's what you mean. Because don't text me Amy Mann because we have a, a, an ongoing text thread where if you just say a celebrity's name with an exclamation point, it means that You'll dead. just assume <laughs> it means she dead. just passed. So don't do that. Okay. Do you want to bring some Bible knowledge into this? Your love of Exodus is, is well known. <laughs> I do. I do love an action sequence in the Bible, and man, the ten plagues of Egypt are really great. This is our second plague in a final count of ten in Exodus. Exodus 8-2. I don't know if you ever caught that in this movie. It's yeah. Exodus 8-2 yeah. when God says, I'm sending the fucking frogs. Direct quote. That's King James. <laughs> Send in the frogs. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Sondheim, working with God. Nailed send in the frogs, but then he's like, not a lot of words rhyme with uh, frogs. Do you mind if I tweak it a little bit? (laughs) Yes. So this is very biblical. I don't think in the Bible they actually rain down. I think they just sort of appear. But hey, I'll give you a mulligan on this one, PTA. Well, apparently he didn't know that it was in the Bible. It was just from- Henry Gibson, laughing star, had to say it. Yeah. I don't know if that's true, but that's like, you know, one of those stories. (laughs) Doesn't that also seem like one of those Hollywood stories? I'm like, yeah, right. It doesn't, especially with you what we know. You didn't know that there was a frog. Like, it's the best plague. It's the most <laughs> fun plague. Most interesting thing that happens in the Bible. It's um, the one where I'm like, this is the plague you came out? Like, first one, God starts out strong. Water is blood. Ooh, yeah. that's a tough one. Get through, get past that one, Pharaoh. Frogs just seems like, ugh, you got all the frogs here? Like, just putting everyone out. It's just, it's not a plague as much as just a, you know, an annoyance. Yeah. Oh no, they're eating all the bugs that are annoying. Unless they are raining, because that does seem pretty terrifying uh, in the movie. I did like that. I knew going in that there, that it rained frogs. Yeah. Famously. Mostly because I picked up on the fact that the game Frogger was behind William H. Macy's head. And I was like, well, I think I know where this is going. (laughs) But I knew it going into the movie, but I didn't know how it would, how it would land so to speak. But the fact that it was so violent, I was like, oh yeah, of course. These yeah. these things would die on impact. No and it's a no lot frogs. of fucking frogs. No frogs were harmed in the making of this movie. Just Thank you for pointing that out. So just in case this wasn't clear, frogs rain down and it's a way, I guess, of- sort Much of connect, like a scuba diver would. Connecting- If he was yeah, sucked up. Everything that's happened. And also apparently this, this all takes place in like a really small area of Los Angeles, which wasn't really- clear in the script but it also didn't need to be so like it's this thing connecting everybody but all these people are like in the same area so you're kind of like okay and apparently this is a thing that can happen especially if like animals what i don't understand so basically animals would be would be picked up by like something like a water spout or a tornado going over water and then like all animals would go up in the air and then they would come down some like basically they're thrown by the uh, uh-huh. what I don't understand why it would be only frogs. <laughs> and I know this is like it's a movie, but like you hear and there's there's like really it's like a rare weather phenomenon. It does happen. Apparently it's happened a lot in the UK in the last century or whatever. But is it like fish usually or what? There's no like video of this happening, of course, because like, <laughs> so I'm like, I'm all and all the sites that you hear are like, oh, it, it, it happened. There's records of it. I can't find those records, but I also didn't research that hard. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of like just be like, OK, I'll, I'll acknowledge that I, it still doesn't make sense why it would just be frogs, because if water spout goes over water, it would also be fish. It would be debris. Yeah. There's some explanations for like when they found like all those dead blackbirds and it was like they're all one species. Why did all these blackbirds? And it's like, well, they travel by. By single spirit species in the millions sometimes. And yeah. if they got too high and they like had flat, basically they flash froze and a bunch of them died. And even if it was hundreds of them that died, it's still a very pro- small percentage of the huge migration that was happening. I'm like, okay, that kind of makes more sense to me. I don't understand it enough to like, 
I've never seen that specifically, but I'm like, okay, but this is like, doesn't make any sense, but it's enough that you're like, okay, this does happen. But what I didn't need was Stanley then sitting in the library watching the frogs happen <laughs> saying, this is a thing. This is something that happens and repeats over and over again. <laughs> Don't forget the zoom in, in Claudia's apartment to uh, just a little snippet that says, but it happened on the edge of one of her paintings. Yeah. Choices. Those are choices. I'm going to say what I have to say for the for the verdict, but it rains frogs in this movie. I didn't hate this moment. I'm trying to piece together how it fits. The only thing I can come up with is that this movie is about fathers and fathers reconciling or abusing their kids and reconciling that abuse or failing to reconcile that abuse in the case of Jimmy Gator. Gator related to a frog? I don't know. So who's our ultimate father? Deej? Mm, Abba himself. Who also is, you know, wreaking out havoc on Egypt, but in defense of his children, the Israelites. Wow. That's all I could really piece together. I do like it as this sort of uniting moment where all these characters, it's not really a uniting moment maybe, but all these characters who had sort of had their own little cells of the story start piercing into other ones. So we see the kid who, the rapping prophet for Officer Jim, for John C. Riley, he encounters Julianne Moore's comatose body right before the frogs hit. And while Frank is having his reconciliation with his father and Phil is sobbing behind him, that's when the frogs start falling then. Claudia has just left her date with Jim and is, you know, alone in her apartment when it happens. But that's when her mother finds out that Jimmy Gator had molested her and runs to be with her. And Jim rescues William H. Macy. Uh, well, he was originally just going to turn around and stop him from climbing a pole, but then rescues was William H. Macy during the frog downpour. To return the, the money he the money stole, stole when he realized, like, William H. Also... Not to derail from the frog discussion, I was like, did we just pull William H. Macy from Fargo and just put him in here wholesale Basically, and just say, yeah. you're also gay now, go. <laughs> <laughs> was, I was like, this is literally just Lundegaard from yeah. Fargo, William H. Macy at the end of his financial rope, just going to weird ends and screaming at himself in a car. That's, that's William H. Macy <laughs> in the late 90s. Yeah, pretty much. All right. I need to go to the verdict right now. Okay, let's. let's go. I also need to go to the verdict. I'm much like Stanley in that quiz show. <laughs> so, DJ. Yes. Magnolia, parentheses, 1999. Paul Thomas Anderson, director. What did you think? What's your verdict? In this movie by Paul Thomas Anderson, uh, directed thereby, starring Tom Cruise. And this movie's stupid. I tried so hard <laughs> to like it. You're in trial as an idiot. And. I will say I liked it more than I did, or I appreciated elements of it more. This is still just a big swing and a miss for me. I like the acting is at points really good and generally very good across the board. But beyond that, I think I understand it. Like, I don't feel like I am missing the point. I think that it, I just don't find it poignant in the same way as the intent is going for. This is an audio podcast. You can leave your mic on. When I'm talking. <laughs> I know. I just, uh, I try and like, at least during the verdict, I like to keep it as quiet as possible. It's like, you can talk. It's fine. This is the essay portion of the test. So I feel like yeah, I need to you let need you, to let you let just go. It. You need to write this out in your blue book. The frogs. I, it's, it's not that I mind so much that it happens. It's that it's supposed to be this like profound moment. You can tell the movie thinks it's profound. Mm -hmm. And I think it's stupid. And I don't like find I found some of the other <laughs> thematic elements of their stories tying together more profound than that. And this was just like just a thing that happened. And they're like, it's not just a thing that happened. I'm like, no, you're saying it's not just a thing that happened. <laughs> I what really bothers me a lot about this movie is the way that it talks about how these coincidences are not coincidences. And it's like, this is a story you wrote. So <laughs> this not being a coincidence <laughs> is is irrelevant. It does not matter. 
<laughs> It'd be like, it means something because you wrote a movie. And then the stories, the examples you gave in the beginning that are supposed to be real examples of this kind of thing are all bullshit. So, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so I don't I, I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm taking crazy pills because you're like, this is a story about a bunch of characters. And I'm like, cool. And I'm like, and they're pulled together by thematic elements. I'm like. Okay, cool. And their lives are all connected and there's no coincidence. It's like, okay, stop. You had me and then you lost me. And if they, if he hadn't like insisted, so I'm not going to just say Paul Thomas Anderson, but that's clearly who's behind this. <laughs> if the movie hadn't like insisted, so who's responsible for this? Vociferously <laughs> that they're like, you know, this is a thing that happened. Like, yeah, it's a thing that happened. You wrote a thing happening. That drives me crazy. It's definitely this a similar effect to what when I first watched it, which is I think I get what you're going for. Maybe I don't. Mm-hmm. Maybe it still went over my head. I'm proud to say I could be wrong. You know what I mean? Like that's totally that's totally fine. And but I think I just this does not work for me. You're a child's an idiot. This movie sucks. What do you got to say, Dan? I wanted to not like this movie, so I have a reason that it sat on my DVD player for. <laughs> a year and a half. I enjoyed this movie. I thought it was very effective. It sort of instantly like reeled me in with this ratcheting tension that at first I was like annoyed by, but then sort of got into that it just kept going and going and going, even though it felt like nothing was (laughs) really actually happening. Yeah. I thought it was effective storytelling in that regard. I don't know. I know what you mean about the frogs and I haven't fully unpacked the frogs and I can't tell if it's just like a bullshit film school moment or if there is meaning behind it. I know what you're saying about the coincidences. And yeah, of course, there are no coincidences movies because someone wrote it. But I feel like it is saying something about maybe the things that happen in our lives. It can feel very random, but it's because a lot of things have happened to get us to that point or get you to encounter a person or encounter an event. It's not really a coincidence because you witnessed a robbery because you walked to the store you walk to the store because you needed eggs. Like, I feel like it's saying it's... That's literally the definition some, of a coincidence. Yeah, I know. But I mean, <laughs> I feel like coincidence is, to me, I guess when I hear the word coincidence, it's like there's almost a spirituality to it. Like, oh, if one thing had been different, everything would have been different. I'm like, yeah. I mean, that's true about yeah. all things. Yeah. There's no... I keep seeing a shape in the window. It's really freaking me out. It's fine. I th- it's probably a cat. Knowing my neighborhood, it's a cat. It's definitely, right? it's definitely it's the one cat, cat right? that like hangs out by your windows, <gasps> potentially. I don't know what I'm trying to say there about coincidences. I guess I think coinc- when people talk about coincidences, they're talking about themselves and how their world centers around them. And then this weird thing happened. And I'm like, yeah, that weird ha- thing happened because a billion other people also are leading lives around you. And that's how it goes. We're all connected in some way in that you're going to bump into someone, you know, while you're on the escalator at the mall. At the mall? What year is it, Damon? 1999. (laughs) I think also, I mean, the part about fathers specifically, I like that it's like specific about fathers and how they just fuck us over is interesting. And I also like the ending where it's like, you don't have to forgive your father. You can. But you don't have to. Some things are not worthy of forgiveness. Philip Baker Hall can go fuck himself. Yeah. Not him, but his Jimmy character, Gator. Jimmy Gator. Yeah. I appreciated that because I think sometimes with these family-centered movies, there is a little too much of a leaning on, but it's family. I'm like, yeah. Who cares? Yeah. Well, and clearly he's a <laughs> monster. You know, Yeah, like, he's a yeah. fucking monster. Yeah. I think there are... It is a little too long. I don't like being that guy. I think if a movie can justify its length, it can be whatever length. I will say Paul Thomas Anderson also thinks this movie's a little long. So I feel like justified in saying, yeah, probably at least a half an hour could be shaved off a little bit. But there is part of me that does appreciate its length because you do stay with these characters for a long time. And I don't know. I feel like a lot of them, most of them are very interesting. And I will be thinking about this movie long after I've seen it, which I think is the best compliment a movie can give, unless it's a piece of shit. But I liked it. Now, DJ, in preparation for our podcast, I did watch the episode of At the Movies with Roger Ebert. And he 
was after Gene Siskel had passed, but before they had really nailed down Richard Roper. Okay. So he had a guest critic on. Ebert was just talking about how great this movie was and and blah, 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 blah. And the woman's like, this movie makes no sense. <laughs> she pretty much actually gave the exact review that you did. <laughs> you know, it had great acting. There were great scenes in it, but this movie is a mess. Yeah. And then Ebert got real upset and uh, I don't think she was invited back. Oh. But he's like, but that's the whole point of the movie. And it was it was pretty charming to watch. Put it in the show notes, Greg. <laughs> that's, that's what's going to happen on this podcast. You're going to get so mad because I didn't like Magnolia. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, there's just going to be a new co-host, and I'll never address your absence. <laughs> and nothing will ever get edited again. <laughs> That's true. And this show will never go out, and no one will hear it. What did you think, everybody? Your inner child is an idiot at gmail.com. I have a feeling we're going to get some emails about this one. You can <laughs> leave us a voicemail or text us 615-576-0525. We really appreciate you listening. We want to thank the patrons of our show, including Just Cuz. Thank you very much. Jonathan Day. And I know Josh Frigo is going to be upset about this verdict. So, uh, you know, Ooh, call okay. us. Let us know. <laughs> Wait, was Josh Frigo also upset about another v- verdict of ours? Josh is constantly upset. He's a very angry man. <laughs> Cackling. <laughs> Karen Curd. Larissa Maestro. Lindsay Halleck. Lindsay Nell. Particle Man. The McWilly House of Cats. Scalphosaurus. Shit on the cartouche. <laughs> T. Smith. <laughs> the, elus- the elusive fan, Grumkin. I sound like Jason Robard saying all these, these made-up names now. The Hands of Fate. The Supreme Ruler of this podcast. The Zesty. Oh, I need you to read this, Max one. Sorry. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> Tommy Boy is my favorite movie. <laughs> Travis Vance. Beth Sermont. Captain John Luke Picard. Caroline Amberson. Demon's Australian accent. Terrible. That was terrible. Dan McIntyre. David Mort. Mm, Dr. Malcolm's uh, heaving bosom. Dramatically placed hot dog. Heather Tuggle. His honor, the mayor. Jackson has an unhealthy obsession with Damon. James Taylor. And Jeremy Powlin. Thank you all very, very much. We really appreciate your support. If you want to support like them, patreon.com slash your inner child is an idiot. Thanks for listening, everybody. Damon's going to name uh, all this is top 10 favorite Amy Mann songs while we are played out. Go. Damon. Well, I mean, first off, I mean, I'm at top of the list. I'm going to have to put Till Tuesday's Voices Carry because I'm not a fucking monster. Yeah. Like, come on. Right. And then, uh, hold on. I think I just dropped something. The, just, the Heart is a Lonely I think hunter. I dropped something on my keyboard uh, here. The Glass Menagerie. Yep, that's a good one. I was just about Telltale to say heart. that one. Save Me, is, that's a great one. Mm-hmm. Freeway, You Never Loved Me, You Could Make a Killing. Lucy Lee and the Cat of Nine Tails. You know, I'm going to, Pavlov's Bell, actually that was on that album that that guy gave me. Humpty Dumpty, I think also was on that one too. Mr. Yeah, Pinkerton's Lost in Space, Ransom. that was the album. You know, she's just great. Love Me Vociferously. Are you just making up songs yes. or are these real? <laughs> <laughs> Love Me Vociferously. Filth. Know.